for more on China, the United Nations, and global politics, I'm joined by Dr. Torsten Jelinek in Berlin, Germany. He's the senior fellow and Europe director of Taihe Institute. Torsten, welcome to the Hub on CGTN. Guan, thank you for having me on your show. It's a great pleasure. So what do you make of the fact that it took the United Nations 21 years to recognize the People's Republic of China and for you know, the CPC-led PRC to regain its UN membership? So uh, first of all, congratulations um, to China uh, on this 50th anniversary. So uh, I mean, we were in the midst of the Cold War. Uh, which maybe explains why it took so long to have China PRC uh, accepted as the rightful member. Uh, and uh, it was also a sign that actually the UN had failed to prevent the Cold War from happening, right? And as we were in the Cold War, the United States tried everything not to let the PRC in and to, to keep uh, Taiwan, the Republic of China, uh, as the member representing China, you know, as the central government of China. So, uh, so and, and the United States and its allies were successful over the years, and China tried every year to become a member. Uh, and, uh, but uh, eventually, uh, eventually, with the help of Albania, uh, China could uh, get the majority and uh, uh, got the place in, in the United Nations. So, but having said that, China was also reserved uh, in a way. You know, it didn't see the United States, uh, the United Nation, as a, let's say, a sacred space. Uh, it was rather strongly influenced by the United States. So that was always a criticism um, uh, by, by the People's Republic of China. So, but eventually, like in 1971, China was accepted. So I think that's the, the, the background here. Yeah, you know, in uh, August 1971, the United States proposed another resolution, a competing resolution, basically proposing a, a two-China scenario where uh, Washington says, why don't we do this, folks? Why don't we keep the ROC membership uh, and at the same time uh, accept the PRC as a new member, uh, basically creating this two China um, situation. Uh, why do you think the United Nations did not go down that path? Well, uh, well the United States actually proposed a supermajority here, like two thirds of the vote uh, wanted to prevent PRC to become a member. So, and that maybe uh, was a big hurdle. But uh, on the other hand, there was a big group of members, member countries, uh, which recognized China and uh, helped China uh, to become a member. And uh, what this group also recognized that uh, in order to, to justify, uh, that means that Taiwan, the ROC, was a member. And in fact, they argued they were not a member at all over the whole years. So, uh, so uh, and actually there is one resolution at the United, at the United Nations which says that Taiwan actually is a province of China and not a sovereign country. So as it is not a sovereign country, it was de facto, de jure, never a member. So in that way, China could, uh, PRC could basically get the vote. But it's also, why, did the, the, uh, why, 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 why this was not accepted? It's also a sign that the United States over the past 20 years or so lost relative power. So it was very powerful when it set up the United Nations with also the help of the UK, uh, but uh, you know, 20 years later, uh, uh, the power uh, declined, relatively speaking. So, and that was the right moment, and uh, for China to basically then the PRC to represent China. So, in that way, it's a legal and rightful place back into the global system of international relations. So Torsten, you're from Germany, you're a citizen of Germany, and you once faced a divided country, uh, just like today's China, uh, the reunification of the Chinese mainland and Taiwan. So talk to us about how, in your opinion, the unification of East Germany with West Germany, in what ways can that reunification inform and perhaps enlighten uh, the uh, often sensitive but hopefully eventual reunification of the Chinese mainland and Taiwan? 
Well, thank you for that question. You know, it's a pretty personal question. As I grew up in West Berlin, and, uh, and my relatives were in East Berlin, so when the wall came down in 89, uh, I went to the, with friends, went to the wall, to the Brandenburg Gate, and uh, experienced the joy and uh, the happiness. Of course, uh, even today, there's a lot of work uh, to close that, the difference gap between both sides. But overall, that was the, the, the goal of uh, Germany, to reunite. And, uh, and I can very much understand that this is the goal of China, in, in a broader sense, to reunite uh, in that respect. So, uh, so, and there are similarities between both countries um, to explain maybe a certain direction. Uh, both countries were latecomers into the international interaction, uh, what was dominated by the United Kingdom and the United States in the past century. Those were looking actually for the rightful place in this new world, right? Uh, because they were late. Uh, and after the Second World War, both were divided. Both came out divided of that situation. But here, China, but here Germany integrated into you know, that new history, into the dominant structure which was led by the United States. And China kind of kept on, kept on uh, being isolated. But having said that, the question of China's reunification has a strong post-colonial, post-imperial uh, imperial, uh, imperial element, so uh, because uh, Western forces uh, dominated uh, China, Asia, as we know, and after the Second World War, uh, Taiwan was occupied. There was actually no way, natural way, if you wish, uh, uh, of an early reunification, and uh, that situation was uh, was very different in uh, in Germany. Having said that, I think uh, a peaceful reunification should be the goal, uh, uh, and that happened in Germany, right? That was a, it was a silent revolution on the eastern side, so it, the history provided the right moment, and history must provide the right moment also for China to reunite. Finally, Torsten, it has been 50 years since PRC uh, regained this UN membership. How do you look at China's role in the United Nations system and China's contribution to multilateralism? Well, China is, uh, is in and now today an integral part of the United Nations and uh, it uh, has sent over 50,000 uh, peacekeepers to UN peacekeeping missions. It's the second largest contributor. And uh, so, so and, and on, on the other hand, there's no country, uh, not China, not the United States, not the European Union region, um, which can set up an intergovernmental organization like the UN with 193 member states. So if we, if, we, if we think of that in this way, we have actually a balance. So no country can really, you know, overrule that these days. So we, we have to work on that balance. And I think here China also stands for a new multilateral system, a reform of the multilateral system, because obviously China has its own track into the modern world, uh, has its own history. Uh, and that, um, and that uh, needs to be recognized. So here, uh, China is, I think, doing uh, best in the past 50 years, has shown a tremendous development of China, as we know, and as we see it. And, uh, and I understand that China also thrives on the multilateral system. And in fact, like the European Union, they, they both thrive on that. Dr. Torsten Jelinek, Europe Director of Taihe Institute, thank you so much for joining us.